thank you, Father, for... Oh, Father, everything that's in my heart would just come out like this. I thank you for who you are. What you have always been and what you are now and what you always will be. Any confusion, any misunderstanding, any problems that we have with you exist in our poor, reprobate, ruined minds and in the hateful hearts of unbelief that we have. I love you, Father. And I would never have known you, the true and living God, had it not been that you came and walked among us and interpreted yourself to us in human terms that we could understand. For you came and showed us yourself in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we will never discover anything in you that was not in him. We will not learn anything about you that we could not have learned about him. We will never receive anything from you unless we receive it from him. And so, Father, I thank you that you came and even though your glory was subdued, yet still it was here like the glory that once abode in the tabernacle of old. You came and tabernacled among us. And we have beheld your glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. As we look to your word this morning, only the Holy Spirit can put together in some meaningful way in our hearts the deep emotions that we feel inside this morning. The mixture of sorrow, deep sorrow, over the unbelief that surrounds us. And yet with this deep sorrow, a deep joy that no man can take from us. That joy of knowing in our hearts the reality of who you are and who we are the great God of heaven has called us to be his bride not his servant his bride and we've been wedded to him in bliss that cannot be explained glory that's unspeakable and full of joy that's unspeakable and full of glory Thank you for the reality of this love relationship with you in Jesus Christ. May the Holy Spirit have the liberty he longs for in our hearts that we might hear him this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to read in just a minute or two from the book of Hebrews in the fourth chapter beginning at verse 1, if you want to follow with me in your Bible. I want to make a couple preliminary remarks about the book of Hebrews. It isn't important to settle uh, any great theological questions about it, like who really wrote it. You think what you will, and I'll think what I will. I feel in my heart that Paul wrote this book. I had to give reasons for it would simply be that it's... I just know Paul so well, it just sounds like him. It just sounds like him. I don't know of any other man of, of his time that could have written it. Vast knowledge of the Old Testament Scriptures is in it. And the keen insight that he had into the hearts of men that he preached to. He had the discernment of the Holy Spirit. Jesus manifested when he was here upon the earth. In one place in the Gospel of John, it's reported that when the people saw the miracles that he performed, it said many of them believed in him. But quickly adds, but he did not commit himself to them because he knew what was in them. They didn't fool him for a minute. They believed only the miracles that they saw. 
It was not him that they believed in. It was the unexplained that he did in their presence that they believed in. They had no personal faith in him, and they had no personal attraction to him, and they did not personally appropriate him. They just saw the miracles which they could not deny, and they believed in the miracles. They wanted from him, and they wanted to use him. And even though they spoke up and said, we believe, it says he did not commit himself to them. You can't con Jesus. You can't fool him. You can't deceive him. You can fool yourself, and you can fool me, but you can't fool him. He knows what's in your heart. He said, I know what's in man. I don't have any need that anybody should tell me what's in man. I know. And Paul displayed the same discernment when he preached. Now, it was not Paul's wisdom that gave him this discernment. It was, of course, the same Jesus in him that once walked the shores of Galilee. And as Paul preached, and as all preachers do who preach in the power of the Holy Spirit, they have a way of sensing through the power of the Holy Spirit. The unbelief that's there, even when it's covered up with professed faith. You with me? And so, Paul, writing to the Hebrews, Jews who had professed to believe in Jesus. Now, no one would have written anything he wrote to Jews, period. Jews wouldn't want to read anything this heretic had to say. But the people who read it were those who had professed to believe on Jesus. He came preaching the gospel of grace and they said, we believe. But now he's, a, he's alarmed and he's concerned. And this is what makes this book one of the most misunderstood books in the New Testament because almost all of the professing Christian world misses its entire message. The book of Hebrews is used as a book to show that you may be saved, but uh, you're not in Canaan land. And therefore, the whole book of Hebrews is written to bring you into the Canaan land of Christian perfection, or the Canaan land of Christian blessing, or the Canaan land of Christian rest. I'll tell you what the message of this book is, and it's the most relevant message I know. It's a message of warning, fearful warning mingled with sorrow. For those who give lip service to the gospel of Jesus Christ, whose hearts have never, never entered into the rest of God. It's a warning written to men and women who have professed to be Christians and are not Christians at all. It's a book written to religious people who have never known salvation. It's a book written to those who began in the spirit and now strive for perfection in the flesh. It's a book written to men who says they believe in grace, but they walk according to works. It's a message written to men saying, don't harden your hearts. Don't turn away from this message. Don't neglect it. Take heed. The promise is still standing. You can enter in, but if you don't, you will be like those of us who fell in the wilderness because they refused to follow Joshua into the land of rest. Joshua, you know, when that word is transliterated into English, becomes the word Jesus. You stood back, and when Jesus said, you've got to come in and rest holy, or you can't come in at all, because if you come in, you've got to sit down and rest with me. I'm not working and you can't work. And if you don't come in and rest with me, you can't come in. And I don't know whether he thinks this way, but I'm a little boy and I think this way. If I were him, I wouldn't want you in there mulling around in your works because you'd make me nervous. <laughs> I wouldn't want my rest disturbed by you scurrying around doing works. Especially not since I had demonstrated to you that there wasn't anything else to do and I had done it all. It would be an insult to the perfection of my own work. So this is the message of Hebrews 
and is filled with heavy warnings. And I can't help but think as I read this passage how like the Hebrew readers this assembly is and tape land is. Those of you who will hear this tape this week, listen carefully. Let us, that is us who profess to be saved, let us therefore have a phobia. You know, this is an age of phobias. Everybody has a phobia. It's either claustrophobia or hydrophobia or acrophobia or whatever. But everybody has a phobia, and a phobia is a fear. Paul says, here's one you should rightly have. Here's a good phobia. Trade all the rest of yours in and get fixed on this one. If you have professed to be a Christian, and the reality of salvation is not your present possession. You ought to be filled with phobia. And the phobia is this, the fear of this promise, this promise of God still remaining, still open to you, left to us at this time. It's here, this age of grace, this time of promise. You should have this fear that this time of promise, this promise that you can enter into your, his rest, the fear of coming short of it, the fear of coming close but never actually realizing it, the fear of being so close, as Jesus said, to the kingdom, yet so far away, the fear of drawing nigh with your lips, and yet your heart is shut out of the reality of the love and the fellowship of God. Have this fear, lest the day of promise close. The day of the Holy Spirit speaking will end. The time of His imploring you will cease, and you will stand outside after others have entered in. And the land of promise closed to you forever, and you perish in the wilderness of your sins, and spend eternity in the wilderness of the blackness of darkness forever and ever. Fear this, you who have heard this promise, and yet have stopped short of true faith in it, have this fear. And listen, isn't this like us here? For unto us, and the Greek brings out an interesting phrase here, we people, he says, have been thoroughly good news. <laughs> Haven't we been thoroughly good news? I don't think anybody on this earth could have any more thoroughly been good news as we've been thoroughly good news. I've been announcing it right here since 1964 in this one spot where I stand this morning. And in this city, I've been announcing it since 1954. And that's 24 years. You have been thoroughly good news. And listen carefully. Unto us who have been thoroughly good news... Just like he said, our forefathers, who were also thoroughly good news. They were not thoroughly good news with the good news wherewith we have been thoroughly good news. They got another kind of good news, and their good news was that there was a place of rest. There was a land of promise. God promised it to them. And every obstacle that stood in their way, he would remove so that all could freely enter in if they will. Those who fell back, fell back, not because of the obstacles. They fell back not because they could not believe or could not enter in. They fell back because they would not believe him who promised. And my brethren, the word, the good news that was preached to them did not profit them one bit because it was not 
mixed with faith in them when they heard it. And the Greek again, again brings out an interesting thought. The good news they heard amounted to nothing as far as any practical reality in their lives because they did not personally appropriate by faith that good news unto themselves. You hear me? Yes. Please tell me that you hear what I'm saying. For we which have believed, we who have truly believed, we who have personally appropriated this good news for ourselves by faith, we who have actually entered in by means of faith in this promise, we have entered in to rest. We have rest. Do you hear? We have rest. That's how we know we have entered in. If you don't have rest, you've never entered in. If you have rest, you've entered in. It's just that simple. Rest is the fruit of the land. It's the milk and honey that flows in this land. It's absolute rest. Not restlessness. Rest. God said that he swore in his wrath that the only way anyone would ever enter into his rest, though the works were finished from the foundation of the world, they would have to enter in by faith in the promise. No other way. He made the rest. All they had to do was come in. All they had to do to come in was believing that the rest was theirs if they just simply took it by faith. Now listen carefully. And here we have some deep, heavy things. Must talk about the Ten Commandments. And people every now and then will say, why don't you preach the Ten Commandments? Someday I'm going to preach on the Ten Commandments. Promise. Because something, the message, uh, uh, that the, the message of the Ten Commandments, something that the world has never figured out about the message. It went far deeper than just do's and do nots. There was something spiritual behind what he was saying. A mysterious message he gave to Israel for them and for also us. What did he mean? Thou shalt keep the Sabbath day, remember the Sabbath day, and keep it holy. Was God just hung up on details about some certain day in the week? Did he just want a national holiday for himself? Like National Pickle Week and George Washington's birthday and National Business Week and everything else? Did God just say, hey, I think we ought to have a special day every day and commemorate that day to me? So we'll call it the seventh day. And on the seventh day, everybody will rest and remember God. Now, that's what the world thinks the command to remember the Sabbath means. Oh no, there was a deeper message behind the commandments of God in that. God is not so facetious as to just write down do's and don'ts for people. He is demonstrating in little illustrations the divine principles. And the divine principle behind the commandment to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy is this. He first established this in the book of Genesis. In the beginning when his work was all finished. In the original creation when everything was in full harmony with him. In the beginning when everything was just exactly like it ought to be for the moment. One word characterized his entire creation. It is good. And the fruit of that good state was rest. Man didn't toil. He didn't earn his bread by the sweat of his face. He spent his entire day walking with God. Fellowship. Enjoying 
the beautiful creation around it, enjoying his own lordship over the creation, rejoicing in the fact that everything he could see, everything he could touch, everything he could taste, everything he could feel, and everything he could hear was his, his to touch and taste and hear and feel and smell with all of his senses. It was all good. And it had been made not for God. It had been made for him. And it was God's gift. And he and God just walked around with their arms around each other. Enjoying a perfect life in a perfect world. And after God had made all of this just the way he wanted it. On the seventh day. He rested. He did not rest because he was tired. He did not rest because he needed a little break. He rested because there was nothing else to do. And when there's nothing to do, it means there is nothing undone. And if there is nothing undone, it means there is nothing to do. And if it means that there is nothing undone and there is nothing to do, then the only thing that's left by logical deduction is to rest. We think of rest only in connection with weariness, but God never got tired. What the word rest simply means is that he quit working. See, we only think of rest because we're tired. I have to get my rest. But there's no thought when I say that, when I say I need to get my rest tonight. I'm not thinking of quitting work. I'm thinking of catching up on some physical strength so I can keep right on working. Because if I don't get some rest, I'll have to quit working because I will die. God wasn't in that exhausted, worn out, miserable, wretched, weary state of exhaustion. God rested because there wasn't a single thing to do in heaven or earth. There wasn't anything to do in man. There wasn't anything to do for him. He had done everything there was to do, and it was all finished. And now he and man could just relax and enjoy all that was there, because it was all good. That's why he established the Sabbath after man fell. As a continual reminder that six days shalt thou labor, but on the seventh day thou shalt rest. That is, that the pattern of man's life will be worked. And then, if he enters in by faith in God's promise, he can quit his work forever. And he can rest with God where everything is perfect and where everything is good. Does that sound too, too hard to believe? No, it's so. It's so. Now he says, this was not fulfilled in the time of Adam, that is, after the fall. And it was not fulfilled, surely, when Joshua led the people into the land of promise because... Long after that, David spoke of it as being yet future. And he says, had it been fulfilled when the people went into the land of Canaan following Joshua, David would never have mentioned it again, for it would have been history. But he said, David mentioned it too. And David said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. And that verse in its context has to do with the same subject, God pleading with the people Enter into my rest. Enter into my rest. Don't miss it. Don't neglect it. Don't let that day of promise go by. All of the other things about the Sabbath were pictures and types. This, he says, is the reality coming up. Don't miss it. Now, there remaineth, verse 9 says, therefore, a rest. Isn't that good? Oh, it just sounds soft, doesn't it? There remaineth, therefore, a rest. What does it mean, there remaineth? It means that it is still in effect. The promise still stands. The opportunity is still here. Today, if you hear his voice, 
Harden not your heart. This rest remains. It's for you. That is, if you belong to the people of God. Now, we don't have to go into any primary things like belonging to the people of God is not the same as belonging to some organization. Forget that. The people of God are those who have by faith entered in to the rest. It's theirs. It's theirs, not in some time future. In this very moment, this present experience, rest is ours. And then, using again the strong tense of the Greek, he that has once and for all, listen to this, he that has once and for all entered into his rest, that is God's rest, it just necessarily follows as a logical conclusion that when he once and for all entered into God's rest, he ceased from his own works as God did from his. Now, so much for the text and the passage. Professing Christians are the strangest, hard to understand, weird, mixed up, bent out of shape people I've ever run into in my life. If sanity is synonymous with professing Christianity, God help us all to be crazy. The more I think about it, the more troubled I get about it. Most professing, all professing Christians are strange, unusual, weird, inconsistent people. Now listen carefully to what I say here. Wherein lieth their inconsistency? Well, their inconsistency is in this. They are constantly saying by every action of their lives and by every reaction of their hearts, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. We have entered in, Lord, but we have no rest. I trust you, Lord, but I can't trust you. And I said they were inconsistent people. I take that back. They are the most consistent people I know. They are absolutely consistent in their inconsistency. Professing Christianity. Hear my phrase. That is that large mass of millions of people in America alone who will stand up someplace this morning or sit down, whatever the case may be, and avow and confess that they believe in God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and that they are Christians by their own admission, that they are believers in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yet the large percentage of these people who confess to be saved people this morning, and that includes us too, have come short of salvation. The gospel they have heard has never profited them, for it was never personally appropriated by faith. The majority of these people have hardened hearts. I'm much more concerned about hardening of the heart than I am of hardening of the arteries. These people who are supposed to be resting are always working. And while they are working themselves into a state of exhaustion, they are busily saying with their lips, We are at rest. We are at rest. I'm not talking about manual labor now, you understand. I'm talking about spiritual works. Einstein was right. He may have been an infidel in his personal faith in the revelation of God, but he was sure right in many things that he discovered. 
Now, you know George Bernard Shaw. He wasn't anything but an old blasphemer and infidel and died and went to hell. Good place for him. But he said some things that were interesting. One of them was and that uh, he knew there was life on other planets. And they asked him, how do you know that? And he said, because they're using the world for an insane asylum. <laughs> and he was right. He was right. He figured that all the people in outer space had sent all of their mental cases to the earth. Because that's the only kind of people he'd ever run into. And Einstein was right. He had a lot of truth, too. And one of the things he said was this, that he had discovered that there was no such thing in all the material universe as a state of absolute rest. That the entire universe was in continual motion, continual agitation, continual movement, always traveling but never getting any place. And everybody worn out by the continual work. And he said, if there is a place of absolute rest, if there is such a thing as a state of absolute lack of motion and activity, it will have to be outside the universe because it does not exist in the universe. He was right. When I speak of the universe, I speak of the three dimensions that we can measure but there is a dimension that cannot be measured with natural instruments. It is a fourth dimension beyond the third. A fourth dimension, oh, it can be measured, but not with a physical instrument, not with actual ears, not with actual eyes. But this fourth dimension can be just as real to you as the third dimension of materialism is to us. And it is discerned by a special instrument which God will give to any man who wants it. It's called simple faith. Faith can make real the unreal. Faith can give substance to what we cannot see and feel and touch and taste. Faith can make the invisible things appear as visibly as the sun shining in the sky today. And the clouds. The fourth dimension, there is a place of absolute spiritual rest. A place that flows with milk and honey. Are you caught talking about Christian perfection? No, not in the sense that the religious world says. In fact, you have to be quite imperfect to get there. <laughs> They won't let anybody in but sinners. The wickeder they are, the easier they get in. This place of absolute spiritual rest is promised by God and simple faith will put you there. And once you get in it, when you once and for all have entered in to this rest, once and for all, you can't go in and out until you make up your mind whether you want to stay. You don't get saved two or three times or four or five times. You don't go in and stay a while and say, Oh, I miss work and I'm going out and work some more. No. Once you enter in, you never come back. Number one, you don't want to. It's not that you're incarcerated there. There's nothing to come back for. The world of works is not any place to go back to. Not after a man has worked as hard as Christians have worked, come to the end of his labors and his strength, and sat down to rest, he's not interested in going back to any more Mondays at the spiritual salt mines. Okay? What I'm saying in a lot of fancy uh, rhetoric is believers never become unbelievers. And resters never become workers. The converse is true. Workers never become resters. And unbelievers, as they continue in their unbelief, do not turn into believers. Work is a word that describes the professing Christian world better than anything I know. Lack of rest is its fruit. 
Listen carefully, and I'm going to talk plain to you this morning. Number one, professing Christians started out in this world, of course, professing unsaved people. I mean, they, they professed to be unsaved at one time. Now they profess to be saved, but once they professed to be unsaved. And back when they professed to be unsaved, they worked themselves to death trying to get themselves saved. They joined the church, they got baptized, they took communion, they got indoctrinated, they studied their Bibles, they prayed, they repented of their sins, they did everything they knew to get themselves saved. And when they couldn't get the job done, they finally just gave up and they said, well, I'm talking about professing Christians now, may the Lord sort them out. When they just gave up on it, they just said, uh, well, there's nothing I can do to save myself about. The only thing left to do is trust in Jesus. That's last resort, like a fire extinguisher hanging on the wall. I've thrown all the water I can on the thing, and I can't get it out. I hate to stoop to use the fire extinguisher, but I guess I will. All right, Jesus, I accept you as my Savior. And so if that had been a true faith that came from the heart, Believing in his heart unto the righteousness of God, the blessed fruit of that faith would have been a thing called rest. <laughs> now, about the only kind of rest that I see, I'll tell you about that later, but first of all, they worked to save themselves from the past. Because it was the past that were making them work so feverishly. They could look back and see the awful sins of their lives. And so they worked, 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 worked. Some way they have to appease the holy God they know exists. And so they labor to be delivered from their past. Saved from their past. Have rest in the conscience from the past. And at the same time, they hope that in arriving at this place of rest in conscience from the past, they will have some rest about the future. Now I can rest in regards to dying. So they rest in regards to the past, which is dead, and they sit down and rest in regards to the future, which is dying, and they engage in the same feverish work, never ceasing, that they were engaged in before, only now they call it something different. They are now working for the Lord. But what that really means is they are indeed working now to save themselves from the presence, from the present time. They're at rest about the future. When I die, I'm sure I will go to heaven. They're at rest about the past. I'm sure my sins were forgiven. But they have not a single moment of rest about life. They can't face life and they can't cope with life. There is no rest. I'm not talking about jobs and houses and families and lands and cars and televisions. I'm talking about spiritual rest in the heart about my relationship to God. All millions of people have a rest that they say has to do with the past and a rest that they are sure of for the future. But hey, they are terrified, miserable, wretched, hard-working, exhausted, weary, worn-out people trying to keep themselves saved in the present lest they lose the rest for the future. With me? Okay, here we go. Mercy. So they devise all kinds of ways to have this daily rest. They confess their sins. A brother called me one day long distance from way, way off. And my heart was so heavy when I heard him telling me some of the things that he did. Now, of course, 
He said he'd read Jesus loves me and had made him a free man, had delivered him, had blessed his soul. He said, I never knew there was anything like that in the gospel. But as he told me a little bit about his past experiences, I can still remember the anguish of it in my own heart. He said, I used to make lists of my sins. And then I would confess them methodically, one at a time. And he said, then I'd get them all confessed. And then I couldn't sleep for worrying about them. Then I confessed the sin of worrying. And he said, it was all misery and it was all hard work. He said, the message that you gave in Jesus loves me has set me free. Listen carefully. Professing Christians work to save themselves, and then when they think they have accepted Christ as their Savior, and they're saved from the past and saved for the future, then they set about to engage in a daily work that will keep them in fellowship with the Lord. And God help us, if that isn't enough work to take on, <laughs> they dedicate their lives while... Keeping themselves in fellowship with God, they dedicate the rest of their strength, time, money, abilities, and life to trying to save other unsaved people. And the portion of these professing Christians who are not dedicated to saving the lost are dedicated to saving the saved. True? True. I talked with another person a long distance a few days ago, and they told me about being in a meeting. <coughs> and as I listened to the meeting, they were giving a report of this, uh, what was supposed to have been, not in the person's eyes who was telling me, but the people who were there, in their eyes, it was supposed to be a very ultra-spiritual meeting. And it, it was by a bunch of people who were dedicated to getting the demons out of each other and sanctifying each other and, and praying the sins out of each other's lives and getting them all perfect and getting them holy and getting them straightened out and getting on their white robes and making them righteous. And as I sat and listened to it, I'm just a little boy, you know, and I got confused. And I said, wait a minute. Uh, I don't understand this uh, everybody wanting to be the Holy Spirit. I don't understand all these Jesuses going around laboring day and night to cleanse each other. I don't understand these lords that go around trying to save the lost and save the saved. You see, the whole professing Christian world is marked with one endeavor, and that's work, 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 work. By working to save others, I am in essence trying to save myself at this moment and give myself a little bit of rest and assurance that I'm in the right relationship with God. That's what it's all about. Because you see, the conscience of man, God blessed the conscience. He put down inside of each one of us a little mechanism called a conscience that cannot be quieted and cannot be purged, cannot be silenced, cannot be rested, apart from faith, total, complete, and ultimate rest in the finished work, in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Conscience can't find it anyplace else. And because the conscience can't find it outside the blood of Christ, the conscience is like a cruel taskmaster that drives men incessantly in their works. Dead works that they might serve the true and living God. And so there they are out there saving themselves, saving everybody else, perfecting the saints. Weird. Didn't I tell you it was a weird world? Weird. Now we'll make some statements which you've heard before, but you need to hear again. First, I have to throw this in. This is extra and won't cost. I had tears when I left the house this morning because I started to get in the pickup this verse of scripture dropped down on my heart in relationship to this message. When Jesus hung on the cross of Calvary, someone shouted, Save thyself and us. 
he saved others, himself he cannot save. And I thought, Jesus himself couldn't save himself. And because he couldn't save himself, he couldn't save anybody. Yet here is the professing Christian world who not only believes that they can save themselves, they believe they can save everybody else. And they're just saving them by the millions and counting them decision cards so fast that God himself can't keep courthouse records in heaven up to date. Any man who thinks he can save himself believes in his heart he can save you. And he'll go to work on you just as soon as he's sure he's got himself saved. But I want to tell you something. When you know that you can't save yourself, you also know you can't save anybody else. Oh, you say, but we're soul winners. No, we're not. That's blasphemy. There isn't a soul winner alive today. There never was a soul winner. Who seeks lost sheep and saves them? Jesus does. He's the soul winner. No soul winner brought me to Jesus. You say, well, God uses men. Sure he does. God uses men. I tell you, all the eloquence of men, all the intelligence of men, all the learning of men, and all of the rhetoric of men, and all of the pressure of men, and all of the reasoning, and all the arguments of men can't touch the heart. The heart has to be opened by the power of the Holy Spirit. And God has to reveal himself in Jesus Christ and he has to bring rest through a revelation of what the Lord Jesus did for each of us. You can tell others that you're reconciled to God by Jesus Christ. You can walk around wherever you are, not preaching, being what God made you. And if there's anybody around you who wants to know how you got to be made what you are, or how you became the righteousness of God, you have an opportunity to tell them it was the faith, not surely by works. I don't believe in soul winning. If I was a soul winner and I believed in soul winning, I'd want to be able to produce wounds in my hands for fear somebody would ask me for them if I tried to get them saved. God only has one Savior. His name is Jesus. And that word means Jehovah's salvation. Jehovah's salvation. This ought to fill box 279, Belpria High, 45714, tomorrow with letters. <laughs> At least by the end of the week. Thank you. Keep them cards and letters coming. <laughs> I want to retract it. Don't send them on postcards. You can't put money in them. <laughs> now I want to say some things you've heard many times. Man is not saved by anything that he does. He is not lost because of anything that he does. A lost man is not lost because of anything he did. Because if he were, then all he would have to do would be stop doing whatever it is he did, and then he'd be saved and he would need Jesus like a hole in the head. No man is lost because of what he did or of what he is doing. For Christ died for that unsaved man's sins, bore them in his own body on the cross, was wounded for his transgressions and bruised for his iniquities. God does not hold sins, iniquities, and transgressions accountable to any man, for that account has been settled in the blood of Jesus Christ. Nobody gets saved because of anything that they do. They don't get saved because of anything that they quit doing. They get saved by believing God when He tells them that there is nothing they can do and that everything that had to be done has already been finished.
Do you hear that with your heart? The gospel, brethren, is not to call upon men to believe what God will do for them if they believe. The gospel is to call upon men to believe what God has already done for them when they did not believe and while they yet do not believe. Rest. It's a wonderful thing, rest. I'll tell you one of the things that wears people out inside. I mentioned that it's a thing called the conscience. I heard people say, my conscience don't bother me about anything. Well, your conscience don't bother you about anything if your conscience has been purged by the blood of Christ. But unless that's a reality to you, your conscience will continue to bother you the rest of your life. It will never be silenced. We say, well, we'll be seared like flesh with a hot iron. Yes, but flesh seared with a hot iron becomes more sensitive than flesh that's never been seared with a hot iron. True? Oh, yes, your conscience will bother you. Listen, down deep inside of every one of us is a gnawing inescapable conviction that our sins must be punished. Do you believe that? Yeah. There's some kind of an inborn, natural understanding and conviction that we will never have any rest until our sins have been punished. Let me explain it in just a little simple way. You know, when I'm indebted to someone, I feel much better when I can repay that debt totally and know that I'm not obligated anymore to that person. But there's something gnaws at me down inside and bothers me when he refuses to let me pay. You with me? I know he's sincere. And I know that he wants to just cancel the whole thing, but there's something down inside of me that says, that's not quite right. I need to pay the debt I have incurred so I can feel right inside about it. You understand that illustration? When I was working in the penitentiary, I used to wonder how so many of the men that I met could be so well adjusted in such adverse circumstances. Well adjusted emotionally. Oh, some of them went bananas, but not all of them. Some of them, in fact, were happier than they had been in their lives. And when I got to counseling with them, I'd begin to pick their brains a little bit and uh, try to find out what was at the root of it. And this is what I discovered. It's a thing called self-redemption. They were relieved that they got caught they were resting now for they were paying for their sins. And the punishment they got, they felt inside they had deserved. And once they had suffered their punishment, they would be free of the conscience inside of the crime. You see? Oh yeah, there's something down inside of us that says, you run up a debt, you got to pay. You can't be at rest in the conscience till you know that your sins have been punished. The dying thief said, I'm getting just what I deserve. And that gave him some relief while he was dying. I'm paying my debt. My sins are being punished. Now, let me go a step further. In the cross of Calvary, there is no thought of Jesus Christ appeasing a wrathful God, placating an angry despot. There is no thought of him paying with a pound of his flesh for the ten pounds of my flesh. Heathenism, 
teaches exactly that. The altars of the heathen are saturated with blood, but it is the blood of the devotees who come and shed their own bloods in an order to placate this angry God they believe in somewhere off in the sky. But Christianity teaches that the altar is saturated in blood too, but it's saturated not with the blood of the sinner. It's saturated with the blood of the Savior. That's different. God giving himself for you instead of you giving yourself for God. Isn't it markedly different? This concludes part one of CS 138, God's Rest. For the continuation of this message, please follow the link to CS 138 part two, God's Rest Conclusion.